Hi, listeners. So just before we jump in this week, this is the last opportunity to provide feedback via our listener survey. We have had so many responses and we're really excited to delve into them and see what you said. Paul, they have free text boxes, which I think is something you've long advocated I love free text for. boxes. Tell us anything. Say whatever you like. Okay. And um, and you may have noticed Outrage Optimism doesn't have adverts. That's because we are generously supported by foundations who do not need money, but they do need data saying what's the impact and how mm. it's working. And we need that too to make the podcast great. So hopefully you will respond and provide us with information and we can make the podcast better and we can respond to our funders. Thanks so much. Here's the episode. Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivik Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we catch up on news from the Earthshot Prize in Boston. We discuss what's at stake at COP15 in Montreal. We hear from the incredible Sanjan, CEO of Conservation International. And we have music from Boyish. Thanks for being here. So, friends, we're going to kick off, first of all, with, Christiana, your incredibly exciting trip to Boston that I was very jealous of as I kept watching videos come through on social media of Prince William. And somehow you were always in the video. I and sort the of, most yeah. famous people in the whole world, yeah, the reddest exactly. of red carpets that there have ever been. But just before we do... Oh, it's no, that... no, not red. It's green. It green. Green, forgive me, for green is the, green, the greenest of green carpets. Just before we do, um, it's that time of year again, and Spotify have been sending us some statistics about how the podcast has done this year, and I have a question for you both. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, probably millions, in fact, many of them covering topics of the day, issues that are, you know, in popular culture, etc. And so we in our little eddy focusing on the climate crisis are probably never going to be the biggest podcast in the world. But we're always in the charts, top 100 in the UK and the US, which is pretty good, although we think we can go further. But my question is, what percentile do we reside in for people who have shared podcasts this year? Are we in the top 15 percent? the top 5% or the top 1%? For people who have shared podcasts. Most shared independent. podcasts. Most shared Most podcasts sh in the world. Well, because you've asked the question, leads me to think that we're actually pretty high. Or it could be so, because we're pretty low. Or it could be pretty low, but I, <laughs> I hope think we're in the so. 100%. That's where I want to be. <laughs> so top 10? That wasn't an option. It was top 15 or top 5 or top 1. Okay. <laughs> All right, top five. You would never have said if it wasn't top one. It's top one. What? Oh. Isn't that amazing? Top 1% of the podcasts in the world. And it's wow. the metric I like the best because it's the most shared. Yes. So people listen to it. And thank you, listeners. People listen to it and they decide they want to share it with their friends, share it with their family, which is why we're seeing the numbers go up. And I just felt that really made my day when I saw that statistic. That makes thank my you. day also. Thank you for Aww. sharing. Thank you for sharing. I don't think you're talking to me, but you're welcome. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, actually. I'm talking to the many thousands of people out there. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Now, the Earthshot Prize, the world's most prestigious environmental prize, uh, had its second prize-giving ceremony this week in Boston at the JFK Library. Christiana, you were there. We were all watching you, as we said. How was it? What happened? Well, actually, we did have a few events at the JFK Library because you will know that the Prince of Wales was inspired by President Kennedy's moonshot 60 years ago and said, if we could do a moonshot 60 years ago, why can't we not do an earth shot or in fact, five earth shots now, 60 years later. So in honor of the original inspiration, we did take the Earthshot Prize Award Ceremony and you say we, Boston. Christiana, because you are actually the chair of the board and the prize giving council, correct? Correct. Correct, yes. correct, correct. So this was actually quite exciting because we did do a couple of events at the JFK Library, which is a beautiful, beautiful museum and library in case anyone hasn't been there uh, and you're in the vicinity of Boston, very recommended. But much more exciting, I must say, um, is the fact that the award ceremony was held at the MGM Concert Hall, which is adjacent to Fenway Park. And so we did an amazing, amazing event at the Concert Hall and then moved over to Fenway Park. 
for the reception. And it's it's very different to be standing there in long dress and black tie, looking out at Fenway Park, all lit up in green with Earthshot Prize, et cetera, et cetera. Very different from the usual uh, sports-driven Fenway Park view. So quite, mm. quite exciting. And I must say, what an amazing array of people came out to the green carpet. Green so we carpet. had Ellie. Yeah, we had Ellie Golding, who has been on our podcast. Aww. Billie Eilish, Annie Lennox with her <laughs> piano and everything. Oh my gosh, that was so And her moving. ferocious talent. And her ferocious talent, and uh, just to mix things up a little bit, David Beckham was there as well to give out one of the prizes. The duo um, that I am sorry to say I had never seen, heard of, but never seen, the Chloe and Haley Bailey duo. Amazing pair of sisters with by far the two most impressive dresses. If Listeners, if you go to the earthshotprize.org website and you just want to have a visual of what this all was, do look for the two dresses of those two sisters. Just amazing. But um, but really beautiful, fantastic, very, very exciting award ceremony. We awarded five prizes as um as we know, one million British pounds to each one. And perhaps the most um Jermaine, the most relevant for our conversation today that has to do with the upcoming COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention, the most of the five prizes, the most relevant to our conversation today is the one that totally teared me up. Now, you all know it doesn't take too much to tear me up, but this <laughs> this was like streams of salt water pouring down my cheeks, okay? Now, obviously, I knew that they were going to get the prize, but we saw them in live receive the news of the prize. And that was the Queensland in Australia, the mm. Queensland Indigenous Women Rangers Network, a group of, uh, of Indigenous women who are training other women and children now to conserve the Barrier Reef. And it is just, it, it is such a moving and I, I would say really pushing the boundaries effort that they're having because they are bringing together traditional indigenous knowledge of the reef and everything that affects the reef, but they're also combining it with top technology, drones that go out and all kinds of monitor, top monitoring technology. And so that combination of the indigenous knowledge, passion, uh, guardianship of the commons combined with top, top technology to protect the barrier weave and all of this in the hands of women and children is just more than my eyes could bear. Mm. So really, really And, and by the way, Christiana, not the only ones. Uh, Mukuru having sold 200,000 clean stoves, isn't that amazing? What about that? Uh, this extraordinary company, uh, 44.01, actually advanced selling carbon capture storage technology to companies like Spotify. In Oman. Yep. In Oman. What about uh, having uh, uh, Katie with more than 1,000 farmers a part of the greenhouse revolution with an aim to get 50,000 farmers involved by 2027 and even finding a solution to the plastics problem? What amazing companies. I hope that and organizations that will scale wonderfully. Congratulations on great selection. Very and exciting. It's, it's one of the few sort of moments of, um, you know, prominence of the climate issue that's all about solutions and joy and possibility and connection and entrepreneurship. I think it's the most amazing thing. We should, actually, I mean, we should, of course, have the Prince of Wales back on, but we should have Hannah Jones, the CEO of the Earthshot Prize, mm, also yeah. back on or on uh, at some point in the new year to talk about this. Now, we are going to move on to COP15, the biodiversity COP in a minute. But just before we do, there was one other slightly less happy thing that happened last week, and that was um, the release of... A Netflix trailer about what's going on with Harry and Meghan and the palace intrigue and were they cut out and who was briefing against who. And, of course, this is all well above our pay grade to discuss any Not of this good stuff. good timing, I wouldn't have thought. That's the point. So Christiana and I are both on the Sustainability Advisory Board at Netflix and I'm also an advisor to the Earthshot Prize and Christiana is the chair of the board. And so we felt that we needed to speak out not about the content but about the timing because to release that trailer... 
at the moment that the Prince of Wales was trying to draw attention not to himself, but to the winners of these prizes and elevate this entrepreneurship and momentum, we, we felt was not consistent with stated leadership on climate change. So, Christiana, do you want to say anything about that before we move? Yeah. Well, stated and actually and already actual. exercised. For sure. Right? Because Netflix several years ago decided that it would be the broadcast company that really brings environmental content, top-notch environmental content, and really gets it out there to every kitchen table. And they've been doing an amazing job about that. So to see Netflix then try to pull the rug from underneath the Earthshot Prize, which, as Tom said, is the most distinguished environmental prize in the world, um, is actually very disappointing, to yeah. not say annoying, frankly. Yeah. So so that's we said our piece. That will, that will move on. It was in the media, but people may have seen that. Um, I was talking to Zoe, my daughter, who listens to this podcast, may know a bit, this morning, and she came out with a brilliant question because, of course, Netflix also make the series The Crown, which is all about the history of the British monarchy, etc. She said, are Netflix going to have to make another series of The Crown in which they feature the fact that Netflix torpedoed the <laughs> Earthshot Prize with a different series, which I thought was the most sort of like incredible circular Kantian logic. And actually, so it's a very good question. So pretty on it. So yeah, we'll find out whether that's the case. I like that. I, I like the way she thinks. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah, 100%. Good job, Zoe. All right. Now, COP15. This is a very big moment for our planet. The world is meeting in Montreal, Canada for the Biodiversity COP. This, is, of course, has been scheduled to happen uh, since December 2020, when it was due to play, take place in Kunming, China, that COVID put paid to that. But the Chinese remain in the chair. However, the Canadians are hosting. So negotiators have arrived. There were opening speeches today, Wednesday, the 7th of December, from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who didn't pull any punches, as he never does. But let's just think for a minute about what's at stake here. No, um, hold on. He pulled all the punches. No, pull the punches means he he didn't he didn't stop himself from piling in. So he didn't. He, okay. He, he oh, did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite was um, we are now in an orgy of destruction, which I thought. I mean, I don't know who his speech writer is at the moment, but that was. Would you Flushing go to ourselves an, down the toilet? Would you go to an orgy of destruction organized by Antonio Guterres? Let's move on. Um, right. <laughs> who wants to tell us what's at stake at the biodiversity cop? Well, um, you know, um, Tom and Paul, well, well, there are many things that are very interesting about this COP. Um, they have been dubbed the 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 twin COPs or the duo COPs, the mm. COP20, uh, the climate and the biodiversity. And as Tom says, they've been trying to hold this in person for years. And finally, it's, it is happening in this split fashion, which is not unique. It has happened before, certainly on climate, um, but does make it much more difficult to uh, to orchestrate because when you have political leadership on one side from the Chinese um, and then you have all of the hosting leadership on the other side on the part of Canada, it does make it very, very difficult. And the decision that apparently came from the Chinese government several months ago to not invite heads of state was a very, um, a very sad and counter-effective decision not to bring the heads of state to assume responsibility as they should. Because as we know, we are so running out of time, not just on climate change, but on biodiversity, because the two of them are interlinked. Um, and because we don't yet have, just like we have from the Paris Agreement, we have a big, big climate goal, which is net zero by 2050 and half emissions by 2030. But we don't have the equivalent big long-term goal ambition on biodiversity. And this is when it ought to be coming out. And it is dubbed the 30 by 30. We've had a couple of conversations about this on the podcast. Um, and it is about halting and reversing biodiversity loss by 2030 and protecting 30%, at least 30%. There are some that would want much more, but at least 30% of the surface of this planet, whether that is land or ocean, uh, by 2030. That's why it's called the 30 by 30. There is a group uh, called the High Ambition Coalition that takes a page out of the climate change. A high Ambition Coalition 
that was formed for, for the Paris Agreement. And uh, we already have over 100 countries in that coalition that are definitely going to push for the adoption of the 30 by 30. And honestly, right, let's all light our candles and do everything possible for that to be adopted, which doesn't guarantee that it will occur as we know. But at least we should have in paper, in a multilateral treaty, we should know what our um, what our long term goal is in order to guide efforts over the rest of the decade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been sort of preparing to talk today. I've had the opportunity to uh, research all of this and. You know, obviously, I've worked in climate change for quite a long time, and and I I knew about kind of biodiversity, and I know that ultimately, you know, the Earth system is 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 kind of um, emitting and absorbing CO two in a sort of gigantic, uh, living, breathing uh, process. But it really brought it home to me to start to see the figures, and and the the image that came to me absolutely repeatedly. Um, is is really an accounting uh, metaphor, uh, and it's quite literal in a sense. It's funny how seriously we take accounting. You know, uh, like huge companies have to produce these accounts uh, with a, with a profit and loss accounts, a balance sheet. But you know, even a sweet shop across the road, even a little sweet shop, you know, tiny any business in any country has to, by law, produce a profit and loss account and a balance sheet, right? Um, but whole nations produce a kind of GDP number that's a bit like a profit and loss account, but whole nations do not have balance sheets. So we take our sweet shops more seriously than whole nations. Now, people like the OECD produced a report in 2019. I mean, the OECD is a secretariat of the richest countries in the world. They're not hippies. They talked about us doing somewhere between, you know, one, two, three, even up to sort of $6 trillion a year of damage to our balance sheet. So what's happening? We've got this GDP that seems to be rising, but we're destroying our assets. And this is just, you know, this is what happens to companies like Enron. You know, they went bust. You know, you don't Enron Earth, it feels to me. We can't take like a sweet shop more seriously than we take the countries we live in. Uh, the horrific uh, destruction of nature from basically industrial processes. It's almost like the whole commercial system is at war with the whole natural system. And, yeah. and you know, frankly, the commercial system is winning that war. And this conference is, is, is an opportunity for governments to step in and say, you know, uh, red alert. I mean, I, I was laughing because I think it was Swiss reinsurance said something like half of global GDP depends on the function of the natural world. Well, if you're in a spaceship, what percentage of the GDP of the spaceship is dependent upon the life, life support system? It's not 50%, it's 100%. You know, we entirely depend upon nature to survive. And therefore, this, this conference is an opportunity. And the last point I want to make is, it's going to require a cultural shift for us. We are going to have to fundamentally, culturally change the priorities of our societies if we're going to be able to deal with this. That doesn't mean, you know, we've all got to go and kind of live in caves, but it means we've got to focus relentlessly on how massive consumption of, 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 of you know, products and services that require digging up the natural world must end now. Here, here, Paul Dickinson. Good <laughs> job. I like the way you explain that. Fantastic. <laughs> so absolutely. Um, and we will talk in a minute to Dr. M. Sanjan, the CEO of Conservation International, who is one of the world's Who is such an expert in this. Such an expert on this. So so let's let's we're gonna actually speak to him in about 10 minutes. Um just one question following on from what you said, Paul, but digging into what the structure of this agreement is gonna look like. Um, I appreciate that 30 by 30 is like the core central piece of this. But just so I understand and listeners understand, Christiana, do you know, is the idea that that is more like what we would think of in climate as the Kyoto Protocol, where everyone comes together, negotiates an agreement, and then goes back and ratifies it in countries? Or is it like the Paris Agreement, where everyone agrees to the objective, then goes back and makes national commitments in order to achieve that objective? Do you yeah, know which... It's more like yeah, it's yeah, more it's like more that. like the like the Paris Agreement. Yeah, okay. I think you know yeah. the Kyoto Protocol model was helpful at the time, but proved itself um, not to be so helpful in the long term. So it's more like the the Paris Agreement um, in the sense that you need to have a global goal, and then 
every country would would come up with how they are contributing to it. A- and let's understand that because the natural ecosystems of every country are different and there is a different relationship between land and sea, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that every single country would have to protect 30% of their land and 30% of their oceans, right? right. Um, it's like it a nationally is, determined commitment in climate. It's yes. nationally relevant to what makes sense exactly. for that. And so exactly. have the, have most countries already come forward with these national commitments on nature or, or is this a question for Sanjan? Yeah, it would be a question for Sanjan, but... Uh, so there actually have been very few. I hate to tell you that Costa Rica has one, but that's okay. We'll just, you know, not. Has um, Costa Rica come forward with one? Costa Rica, <laughs> Costa Rica. <laughs> um, yeah, right. We'll, 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 we'll just jump over that one. Um, You're ba- basically the but, biodiversity but, superpower but very of Earth, few. right? Very, very few. few, very few. Okay. I mean, really pretty pathetically few, I would say. Okay, okay. So that's an important context as we go into this to make sure it gets implemented. Mm. Uh, right. Can I, I just yeah, mention like one thing on the on the backlash side. Amazing. I mean, you know, we we can talk about how seriously the UN Secretary General governments are taking this incredibly important conference and these unbelievably serious issues. And yet, just today, um, some tiny little hedge funders tried to to attack Larry Fink from BlackRock for for thinking about things like this. So, you know, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a censorship movement that's grown up now. Uh, lots of right wing, uh, uh, you know, Republican, typically Republican Party uh, political figures in the US are censoring now investors. Not only are, is there a question about what they publish, like, you know, kind of is it greenwash? But there's a specifically a suggestion now that investors shouldn't be allowed to think about certain things. They shouldn't be allowed to think about climate change. They shouldn't be allowed to think about biodiversity. And, and I think that the, 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 the smarter minds and the more balanced spirits of the Republican Party need to push back against this idea that, uh, you know, in the great nation of the USA, they would try and censor investors from thinking about certain things. It's absolutely extraordinary. You know, actually, we know climate change is a very legitimate financial issue. Um, biodiversity is a legitimate financial issue. As I said, it's about the balance sheet of the world. And uh, we, we've got to stop this, this movement to censor people from thinking. And I've never heard of anything like it. Yes. Agree, ag- agree again with you, Mr. Paul Dickinson. Oh, the kind. Paul Dickinson. Now, Dr. Sanjan is waiting for us. So we can let him in now. Um, and we can actually do this on air. We normally do this without listeners. But Christiana, I'm assuming you'll ask the first question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You got to sort it out what you're going to say, Clay? <laughs> I think we should let him in first. The, Let's let him in first. All right. It's all sort of like exposing so, the kind of secret. It's exposing you know, the inner world working. So, of yeah. outrageous first optimism. Of all, okay, so we've got... So anyway, Dr. M. Sanjan is the CEO of Conservation International, formerly Executive Vice President of Conservation International. He is a conservation scientist as well as the CEO. He is one of the global leaders on biodiversity and he's joining us while I'm introducing him. Hi, Sanjan. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. Nice to see hey you there. Hey, Sanjan. Good, good to see you now. Uh, now on, on monitor, on screen, Sanjan, just for our listeners, Sanjan is a trustee of the Earthshot Prize. So we were together in Boston uh, in, in the physical, which is quite unusual for these days. Um, we've just shared with listeners, Sanjan, a little bit about the Earthshot Prize and how fantastic it was. Great. But what now we would love to move over to COP15. Yeah, guided um, by you. You so, do know that you are now our, our official guide and guru on COP15. So are you ready for that challenge? I, I'm definitely not ready for that challenge. Can you hear me okay? Does that sound yes. okay to you? Yes. Very yep. good. Yep. And we're recording now. So if you're ready to go, we're... Okay, that's fine. Okay. Great. We'll just jump in. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you... Well, I'm honored to think that I'm your guide to COP15. I'm nervous because... You know, it's COP15. I'm, I'm kind of nervous about it. Mm. Well, so so is everyone else, Sanjay. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but maybe just to um, share the nervousness and make all our listeners equally nervous, um, what, why don't you speak to me, Sanjay, sort of from your gut, right? Uh, here, here we are uh, faced with this huge challenge. I, I sort of feel like this challenge is greater even than the recent climate um, COP, just because we don't have yet the the ultimate goal 
the long-term goal. So it seems to me that there are two things here that are uh, that go hand in hand traditionally in all of these negotiations. One is, can the high uh, ambition coalition of biodiversity, now over 100 countries, can they actually get the multilateral process to agree to the 30 by 30 goal? And as we know, that will come hand in hand with, and what financial support would there be for developing countries to contribute to that? So, you know, this is a, a, sim, a pattern very well known in the climate space that mitigation has to come with uh, support, technical and financial support for developing countries. And it is no different in the biodiversity uh, discussion where a 30 by 30 protection would have to come with financial and technical support for developing countries. So knowing that that is the balance that has to be reached, uh, Sanyan, in your gut, how how are you feeling about the possibility of reaching those two hand-in-hand agreements? In my gut, I think both of those are feasible. They're both possible. They're within the realm of my imagination and the realm of the world we operate in. I am not sure it would be a negotiated agreement. And that's the piece that I think all bets are off. We'll have to see how the next week and a half goes to have confidence that we are either getting there or we we got there. Um, If you genuinely ask me at this moment, kind of at the early part of this COP, the chance of getting both of these things as an agreement, I'd say complete honesty, chances are very low. But can we make tremendous progress? For sure. And in some ways, that progress was already happening even before this moment. Um, That is the trend that I'm seeing. So there are a couple of things I'd take. um, I'd like to give you a slightly different spin on the way you set this up, right? So if you look at the climate negotiations, You'd have to live under a rock, and you heard you say that sometimes, to not know about the impact of climate change and our role in it. Like, there is a general understanding, even though there are some corners of this planet that, that almost uh, voluntarily, not voluntarily, almost by, by force ignore it. Mm-hmm. There is a general understanding, an uplift of information and ideas floating around the climate space. You open any newspaper, go on any website, talk to any company, talk to any government today, and that is there. It, it may even be front and center of their minds. And you have seen an enormous shift in financing that has now followed these ambitions that, you know, we started and put on the table, you know, quite literally 27 years ago, right? COP20, COP1. And that's been amazing. Right. So it's no longer a question of if, it's a question of when and whether it's going to be soon enough. That's where the, now the, the bulk of the argument is around, around the climate COP. Um, yes. In fact... President Macron, and if you heard what he was here in D.C. just a few days ago, and if you see what the EU is now saying, they're actually protesting that the U.S. has gone too far in <laughs> in providing investments for, you know, for, for turning its technological prowess, you know, into the race for the top. That's a pretty amazing space. Through, to be yeah. in. through their yeah. bills, through their bills. It's through yeah. through yeah. their bills. IRA right. and bill, yeah. Exactly. Through the, you know, that the U.S. is now providing too much subsidy. And jobs are going to flee out of Europe and come here, uh, to which some people in the administration say, great, and why don't you do more, right? So why don't we all race to the top? Race to the top. Exactly. So that's a pretty amazing moment. The same cannot be said about nature. Hmm. It is not in the general consciousness of Hmm. people, even though it is far more of a bipartisan issue here in the U.S. and generally abroad. So most people around the world will have less to quarrel about when it comes to nature than they did with climate. And yet... Interesting point. Yeah. And yet we do not have anywhere close to that kind of intensity and focus that we're seeing with climate. And the problem with that is if we don't get the nature piece right, all the rest, all the green revolution that you're seeing, the energy transition that you're seeing, to some extent will be for naught because without the underlying premise of protecting nature, the climate agenda also fails. Are they even the same agenda? They are, in my opinion, they're the same agenda. They have 
different framings and maybe different focus. Um, you might focus on heavy industry and cement in one, and you might focus on carbon-rich ecosystems. But it, both of them ultimately are about managing our planet to be livable for us and all the species of life that we find ourselves surrounded by. Oh, hang on one second. Sorry to interrupt. Christiana just sent a message in the chat here. Sorry, Christiana's just telling us she's got a mandatory update that her computer's going to close down in a minute. So this may be goodbye, Christiana, in which case we hope to see you again. <laughs> well, you should speak yeah. more, Christiana. Yeah. <laughs> Sanjay, this is so fascinating and, and, I mean, completely agree also that nature conservation is by definition a conservative issue. And the fact that we fail to kind of keep the politics of these two things together speaks to the mess we're in on climate and also the fact that we've now brought the nature agenda and the climate agenda largely in the COPs back together, which has been happening for a while. But I think last year in Glasgow was a big step in that direction. But a couple of questions both on how that's happened in the climate agenda and also now this COP. My understanding is that there's a somewhat unhappy history of the world meeting its nature and conservation targets. We've seen various attempts to create these frameworks to create conservation, halt and reverse deforestation loss, but we've never really seen a successfully implemented set of plans that have done what they were supposed to do. Is that fair? Why is that? And how can this time be different? Completely fair. Um... That's a fair statement, and why? Um, it, it really has to do with the money at the mm. end of the day. Mm. It, you know, it, it is about political will, but it really is about the financing. So what we've seen in climate, it's, it's kind of a stunning thing, what you just said, right? It's, it's actually stunning to me. Mm. Nature is far more unifying than the initial debates were about climate. Mm. Like it was literally telling people you can't do this or you have to give up what looked like a better life in order to preserve, you, you know, a livable earth. That's a hard proposition. It's a hard proposition for people like you and I who have it. And it's a really hard proposition for people who don't and aspire to it. Hmm. Nature is unifying. And very few people want to go out and destroy nature. You know, I've spent time with people who are cutting down tropical forests in Liberia in order to make charcoal that they then drag out to sell at the side of the road. That is not an easy job. They make very little. There's no, we're going to do this and we're going to be able to afford an air conditioner next year. That, that, this is like no. basic survival. So people survival. Who are on the survival. Survival. Yeah. Right. People who are on the quote unquote coal face of nature, on the front lines of nature, who are forced to destroy nature in order to make a living, are really on the margins of survival already. Right. So this should be a unifying theme. The reason is we have not yet quite figured out or been able to demonstrate at scale that there is a restoration economy, there is a nature economy, and that, you know, that it is in your own enlightened self-interest in order to invest in these things so that we can all provide for more jobs, etc. That is starting to happen now. Hmm. It's just too slow. So and what, Sanjan, is yeah. it fair to say that those that are struggling with their survival and do have to cut down trees or, you know, whatever, that they're actually not substantially responsible for the destruction? It's actually more the organized industry that is causing most of the destruction of nature. Is that fair or not? I, I think it's a bit, bit of both. So I think it's certainly organized industry. So the big battles that happen often happen without any of the folks who are right in nature actually having any agency to change that pathway. That's the organized business, the bigger macro forces that, that make a country destroy its forest or exploit oil or build a dam. But then on the front lines, too, you know, there is a rural survival issue and, and there is the lack of jobs and lack of opportunities you know, does trickle into into saving nature. I mean, the Liberia example I gave you, I mean, I literally went to a 300,000 hectare, you know, forest con concession, which was supposed to have a small amount developed into palm oil and the rest set aside for nature. That was the sort of general agreement. But for a variety of factors that had very little to do with the people who live within that forest, the plantation never really materialized. The company who started it pulled out of Liberia, the palm oil could not be sold in Europe, and then all the, the 20 villages that were in this forest were forced, because there are no jobs, to go out and cut the forest down hmm. for charcoal. So, you know, you know it's, it's, it's more complex than, than only saying it's the big industries. It's both. 
Yeah. And um, sorry, Paul, do you want to come and do my file for one more question? No, no, if, if, yeah. Carry on. Yeah, so I just wanted to follow this on. So it's really interesting what you say about the fact that this is about the finance, that we see the political world, which is more naturally there. And I would add to what you say. I mean, Christiana and I are often asked, what will it look like when we've done this on climate? And people don't get that inspired about the idea of efficient lighting systems and, you know, more more effective motors. But what they want is a regenerated natural environment that they can live in. It's the thing that that lights us up, right? It's the prize we're, we're aiming for. But it's fascinating to hear you say that the political will has been there, the native constituents constituency of this exists, which it doesn't necessarily exist for climate. There are people that care passionately about restored nature, but the financing hasn't quite worked. So what, how do we, you know, now we hear a lot of talk about things like biodiversity credits and integrating conservation with sustainable livelihoods. What are the through lines there to provide a platform for conservation while also allowing the finance to access these solutions so they can be delivered at scale. Yeah, that was also my question, basically, the investment returns I've heard you speak of. Um, we've got thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs listening to this podcast. You know, How should they look at the business case and how they can get involved? I mean, there is a nature economy coming. It's, it's, it's essentially here. Um, we can't hire fast enough within Conservation International for the new types of jobs that are being created. They're in restoration, they're in carbon, they're in forest management. I mean, that, that's a real field, and it's, it's amazing what I'm seeing happening there. So to answer your question, though, take a step back. There are two parts of this. One is getting rid of all the subsidies that go into destroying nature right now, right? It is hard to just – it's easy to say it's a bit hard to do because you've got to untangle it out from – real subsidies that help people get to that next stage. But there are enormous amounts of funding that goes into subsidizing things that provide actually quite poor return on investment already. And they're often protectionist around a particular industry, et cetera. Getting rid of that, that's about $500 billion of subsidies that flow into destroying nature. We could dramatically reduce that uh, and and make it a much easier task Mm -hmm. to get to a net positive world, a nature positive world. And then the restoration economy. So I see three quick areas that come into mind. One is we've been talking about natural capital for a long time. Hmm. It's finally starting to be actualized. So it's cities protecting watersheds. It's uh, communities investing in coral reefs to protect them from uh, storm surges or insurance companies getting into that. So it's about risk management and resource management at a a finer scale. Mitigation. Mitigation. As well as creating sorry, you know, sorry. long-term... Adapt- adaptation, sorry, I got the, exactly the wrong word. It's adaptation both. business cases. It, it's adaptation. It's some, some of it's mitigation. Some of it's adaptation. Uh, some of it is just simply understanding that, you know, 40% of Mombasa's drinking water comes from one mountain range called the Chula Hills. And if you don't protect that, that water is going, right? So that's one part of it. But we've been talking about that for a long time. Um, it's been slow to emerge as a real, you know, scalable field. The other two parts have scaled much quicker. Uh, one is restoration, uh, putting back things, grazing, grassland restoration, forest restoration, timber management. You know, wood products are having a, a rebirth. They're seen as potentially the new, new, new product of building for the future. Right? It's amazing what we're now doing with wood that we never imagined possible you know, uh, 50 years ago. And so there is an interest in, in, in both harvesting timber, but also restoring forests, you know, at scale. So in Brazil, for example, there's a really interesting initiative done by a private bank to buy up degraded land, restore half of it to natural conditions, mm-hmm. and use the other half for sort of FSC certified timber. So one mm-hmm. side pays the other and kind of keeps it growing. The other third part about it is carbon. And I know that's a bit controversial at times, but the truth of the matter is, you know, there's living carbon on this planet. There are some parts of the planet that are chock full of living carbon, Uh, carbon in trees, carbon in the soil, carbon underwater. If we lose it, it's essentially game over for everything else we're trying to do. Countries ought to be able to monetize that and protect it just as they would protect an, an, oil, uh, uh, an oil deposit, right? Mm. I mean, and I see that like for Africa and the Americas and some parts of Asia, I see that as the new commodity. Like Africa should be a carbon exporter, but green carbon, mm. right? Green carbon. And there is a real reason why we should care about protecting 
the forests of the of DRC or the forests of Indonesia or the forests of the Amazon or Amazonia. Because if you, we don't do that, it's going to make everything else much harder. In fact, it's going to make a climate goals essentially impossible. Mm. That economy is absolutely booming. Like any new new field, there are shenanigans. There are bad actors, but there are also good actors. And I think mm. we ought to promote the good ones and make sure the bad ones are exposed. Mm. So that's really interesting. I mean, that's, I assume that's what you're talking about there is biodiversity credits. Christiana, do you want to come in? You're about to be chucked out. Uh, actually, my computer gave me, uh, in just in the last second, the option not to be kicked out. Oh, it um, gave you a pass. <laughs> Sanyan, um, I am old enough um, to remember when debt for nature swaps were the, the thing, right? And Costa Rica did several, Ecuador did several. I remember several Latin American countries that did it. And given the fact that we're not going to have any handouts on this or on the climate issue, for sure, no handouts. So Obviously, we need to come up with innovative financial uh, models that make sense to both sides in order to be able to funnel the funding that is necessary to protect these ecosystems. You speak a lot about biodiversity credits. I would love to know what is the relationship between that at a conceptual level and debt for nature swaps, which are, of course, I, I'm assuming that one is more private sector related, the other one is more public sector. And if that is the case, are these two financial models, do they go hand in hand? And should we pursue be pursuing both at the same time? You know, Christiana, you're the first person to link the two in my conversations. And you're right, they are related. You know, both of them put a value on nature and then find a way to monetize that value uh, and, and encourage countries to protect it for some kind of monetary value, right? Um, biodiversity is a little bit more fine scale, but ultimately they are the, they're the same essential thing. You're right that debt for nature is mostly the province of governments, uh, whereas how we think about carbon credits is probably more the province of the private sector. But governments play a role in the even in the private sector feel like you see with carbon. Um, debt for nature swaps certainly work. Um, Conservation International started with a debt for nature swap in Bolivia. And I've been to that protected area more recently. It's still there. The indigenous communities that work there are still there, still protecting it. And, and so it does have a long, like this was 35 years ago. It, it's got a good long track record. The Nature Conservancy is quite keen on some debt for nature swaps in the, in the, in the marine space, for example. The challenge with debt for nature swap right at this moment is that the cost of borrowing has gone up. So when we're talking about 7 8% or more, it makes it harder to do, the, do these swaps. So that's a temporary pause because of, of, of the cost of borrowing that has skyrocketed in, the, in more recent terms. Biodiversity credits a new instrument. They try to do the same thing, but by engaging the private sector. So many companies have made these pledges to go, you know, nature positive or, you know, do no harm when it comes to nature. Some of them have made very concrete promises. So uh, Walmart, for example, you know, the CEO of Walmart has stood on stage and said, we are going to protect, I, I forgot exactly what it is, but sort of like 50 million hectares of land and water in order to meet our targets, right? Where should he do that? How, what, what form should that protection and restoration actually take? That's where carbon, so that's where biodiversity credits can come to play where we can quantify the biological value of a place and find a way to swap it with an ambition that a company has made, either for their own supply chain or because their consumers are expecting it. It is much harder than carbon credits to, to make happen because one ton of carbon is the same no matter where it is, whereas biodiversity obviously has, by its very name, it's diverse. But that is a technical problem and I, I feel confident we can overcome it. So my feeling is biodiversity credits are coming. I'd rather get in front of it than behind it. And I'd rather figure out a way to get the private sector engaged in this idea of protecting nature, protecting biodiversity. Hmm. 
Hmm. And how do we protect biodiversity credits from going down the path of carbon credits of the temptation to greenwash? How, how do we protect that? In this case, we actually sh- have to green wa- wash the planet with green. Sorry That's about that. That's now a good but thing. Exactly. It, yeah. It's yeah. a good thing, yeah, yeah. from that perspective. <laughs> but uh, but but you see, how, how do we protect biodiversity credits from the temptation to game the system? Let me use that word. Integrity. Instead. Integrity. I think that happens in every sector. It certainly happens in any new sector. Uh, just look at what the papers are writing about. Or, you know, however you get your news, just look at what's been written about about any new sector that's out there. Right. You'll you'll see this and, you know, everything from WeWorks to FTX. So it is nothing new to think that here we are creating a new class of investment. Of course, they're going to be people who come in to try to game it. The way to get this on the right track is to have the role of government clearly defined. Mm. So I think one of the big mistakes that was made with the carbon sector, so you know, carbon credits, which, which my organization does participate in under quite narrow rules, is that the rules were left to the nonprofit sector to hmm. define. I mean, the U.S. was completely missing from establishing guardrails, or establishing guidance for many years. They're doing it now. But without that, so the role of government is not to say no. And the role of government is also not to never be present in the room. The role of government is to provide guardrails in order to ensure that a new class of investments or assets play by a fair playing field. So, so it starts with the game. And, and by it the way, it starts with the game, and then we get the rules. It right? starts with the game. Yes, and they're nearly always behind the scenes. They're nearly always too late, right? Like, look what happened to Bitcoin. Like, look what happened to you know all of that industry. Like, they're just scrambling to catch up. So, of course, we're going to see the same happen in biodiversity credits. Of course, we're going to see the same happen in carbon. But that's where the governments, particularly developed countries, particularly the global north, Europe, the U.S., the U.K., and others, ought to play some role in defining those guardrails. You cannot leave it to either the country that is trying to get the credits out of their door. They just want the highest price. And if an oil and gas company comes and says, give it to us, they'll say, sure. Hmm. Nor can you leave it actually to the nonprofit sector. That's not ever our role. So presumably, if if, if governments craft really great policy, they can then be um, central to these growing markets. But it's the quality of the policy. It, we've actually often seen, for example, stock exchanges have grown up around the world in history because of good laws and good governance. But um, can I just ask a slightly different question? I mean, reading about the the biodiversity issue, many uh, authoritative uh, sources talk about the need for a sort of cultural change in how we produce and consume. Would you say that the challenge that we're facing is kind of a a little bit about communications and and framing, um, you know, our culture and and, and, and the way we we produce and consume? I think it is about that. But I think that's a lot harder. It, It takes a lot longer to do than moving money. So I think that most of us who are in conservation or environmentalism you know, look around and think, gosh, you know, if only I could get this on television, it's going to change the world. I've been doing TV programs for 25 years, everything from Discovery Channel to the BBC. Is it really changing a lot of minds? I'm sure it's changing a few, but not anywhere near the amount of effort that I've put into doing that. In In a way, it's almost like displacement behavior. What is going to make a difference is either, either strong policies by a country, right, So a country like uh, Colombia or Costa Rica, you know, over successive governments have had a generally positive view towards climate and towards biodiversity or nature protection. Right. And you can see that or because the financial flows, you know, that spigot gets turned on, which is what we're seeing, you know, with um, with the energy transition now. You know, when, when when President Trump pulled us out of the Paris Climate Agreement, I mean, the most amazing thing to me, and I, I remember discussing this with Christiana, was the front, you know, was the full page out of the New York Times by a host of companies from Tiffany's to Walmart. Like, think about those two brands alone and look at what different audiences all saying we're in it. We're here to stay. They weren't doing that because all of a sudden, you know, they just... They're doing it because it made sense for their business. It made sense for their consumers. But most importantly, because what was impressive with with that happening was that the financial sector, the business sector, was sending a clear message. 
And I think that's what sustained us through those Trump years. And now we're seeing kind of almost the reverse, where government is saying, we're going to pour all this money in to make it even more fertile ground here in the United States, certainly, uh, in order to attract investments. So yes, communications are hugely important. So is the messenger. I mean, Christiana is an unbelievably talented messenger at that time when it came to the Paris Climate Agreement, right? It's not just the message, it's also the messenger, um, you know, and the medium by which you're doing it. But don't put too, don't believe that somehow revolutions are going to be caused, and I know this is going to get me in some level, level of trouble, because, you know, people on the streets marching or because kids are protesting from school. They help Power is incredibly sticky. Every revolution we've seen in the past, the same people who were in power before it somehow managed to hang on to power afterwards. I mean, look, I'm from Sri Lanka. I never thought I would see a revolution like we saw about a year ago. Like every, I mean, they burnt the previous president's house down. They burnt his museum down. People celebrated in the streets. Look at really what's happening now and who are back there and who are somehow now managing to still hold on to power. Kind of the same click, hmm. right? So wow. power is sticky. So we, to make this change, we've got to go much deeper than just messaging. Wow, Sanyan. Well, that's a sobering thought. Thank you for that. We really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, because it makes us um, dig deeper in, um, in analyzing where are the opportunities for progress. So Thank you for, um, for, for bringing us back down to, to earth. Um, and Sanyan, sadly, very sadly, uh, we need to come to a close, but cannot do so without asking you our proverbial two questions. What, what makes you outraged uh, and where are your rays of optimism? The cheapest, most effective thing that we can do to change the lives in a positive way of my three-year-old daughter is protecting and restoring nature at scale. Mm -hmm. It'll provide jobs in rural areas that are hard to find. It will create a more sustainable environment for everything from businesses to infrastructure to people's lives. And it is the bedrock, the foundation upon which the climate argument, the climate challenge has been built. We are now trying to get in there deep under the earth and literally change our foundation, shore it up. And I think this COP is a crucial moment to do that. And yet I feel that this moment is going to pass. Hmm. It is not only because we haven't done the work to get us there and because of COVID and because of the strange leadership that we have right now at CBD with, with multiple countries, um, you know, trying to move things forward and the whole organization of it. But the piece that it's not, it's like, a, it's what really makes me cry is that this is the cheapest, best way we can save our planet and save our lives and save all of the lives that we have evolved with. And yet we are fittering this moment away. Yep. There's another CBD that's going to happen in Turkey in two years. And whatever happens out of this one, we got to make sure we're prepared for that one, right? Ray of optimism, the energy transition. Mm. Like what an amazing moment to be here in D.C. I was in the room with President Macron where he sort of both pleading with and cajoling and slightly berating a group of congressional leaders that the U.S. has gone too far <laughs> by providing <laughs> too many subsidies to, you know, renewables. Amazing. It's like, a problem amazing. we should all have. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great problem to have. And he, and he said it as well. You know? It's like telling someone they ran a marathon too quickly. You can't do yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, you know, like we gave him better shoes, right? Like, <laughs> it's fantastic. What a wonderful problem to have. And what, what he's, not, he's not saying don't do it. He's saying synchronize better, right? Mm. Synchronize yeah. Europe and the U.S. We get, we, we all for that. But a wonderful place to do that rather than simply, it's now leveling up Europe rather than, you know, leveling down someplace else. Right. That's, That's a great way hope. to put it. Yeah. And that happened and, and because Sanyan, of all of you. And, and Sanyan, had they tried to synchronize with Europe, they would have missed the political window to do so. 
hundred percent. This mm. this was the right way to do it. Yeah, they go do absolutely. some negotiation with Europe and come and try to sell it here in the U.S. Wouldn't have no happened. Way. Yeah, wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, right. Well, Sanjan, such a delight. Uh, such a delight to have you here on the podcast. We will be very attentive to uh, everything that is happening on COP15. Thank you so much for so many years, Sanjan. So, 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 so many years of uh, of really carrying this torch as you and everybody at CI have been doing. So here is our gratitude to you, to your whole team, and and to everyone in that space, right? Because those of us who are more in the climate space have educated ourselves that actually that boundary between the two spaces needs to be torn down. And uh, you have always been uh, pleading for that. So um, thank you so much for uh, for everything that you've done also on on that one. Delightful to talk to you. Well, th- th- thank you, Tom and Paul and uh, Christiana. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for everything you guys do. Great to thank have you. you. See you soon. Bye. See ya. Clay, happy? Got everything you need? Yes, we got everything, everything that we need and we're still recording, so we can just go ahead. Okay. So, so good to talk to Sanjan. I mean, what a leader he has been for so long on so many different issues. What We should probably do a pretty quick wrap up because we this has already been a long episode, although very fun. What do you both leave the conversation with? I, I was really struck about, well, it's a point that had been made earlier that... Um, you know, 30% of global action on climate change is, is, you know, needs action on nature, but only 3% of funding is going to that. It, it seems to me that the climate change movement and the biodiversity movement are the same movement. We've got very, very technical in climate change. We think about renewable energy and windmills and costs of solar falling, and we think about smart grids. Now, I've been saying, like, the internet's going to be laid over the energy infrastructure, but probably the internet's going to be laid across nature as well. And actually, we should see this as a single integrated movement. That was the, that was the thing, the standout for me. Um, the standout for me is something that I hadn't thought about and was amazed that I hadn't thought about before, which is his comment that nature or the protection of nature um, is less politicized than climate because everyone wants to protect nature. That is, I, I'm not sure if that is factually true, but let's say just out of my gut, I would say that is a true statement. And I'm a little bit concerned about the fact that that is a fact because of the following. In climate, we know that we have politicized the conversation incredibly. And there is no factual reason why climate ought to be more politicized than nature because we're all feeling the effects of climate impacts. So, I'm a little bit concerned about which way are we going? Are we going to go the way of politicizing nature unnecessarily and uh, and and against all our interests? Or will the climate discussion be inspired by the non-politicized nature of nature discussion? And do we move in that direction? So I'm a little bit concerned about which direction are we going to follow? Yeah. That's such an interesting point. I've had that thought before. And I mean, I think that, you know, there's, there's, we could just talk about this a lot, but arguably this issue of climate came to a certain degree from those who sounded the alarm on the left and the solution proposed was a regulatory solution. So those who proposed deregulation resisted and that got embedded and entrenched to the point where it then became systemic. But I really hope, I mean, certainly here in the UK and across Europe, and I think even in the US, I mean, you know, the cities tend to be left-leaning voters and the rural areas tend to be right-leaning voters. And people who live in those rural areas tend to want to not see them destroyed and changed. So I think it is true that we see a right of centre interest in the concepts of conservation, local conservation in particular. Um, And that can have dark elements to it as well, for sure, but it can also be positive. So I took that away from it too. And I think that that's really, I think, an encouraging thing if we can see it both as local as well as global, because that's often mm. where that fault line lies. Um, yeah. but, just to say also that the, the companies are coming to to realise this now. We uh, we actually had 7,700 companies talking on biodiversity uh, this year to us, but less than 50% are taking action. So there's a gap between awareness and action. I also think that we should set a new um, 
target for legislation in the US that if it makes the French president come over and complain <laughs> about how good it is, <laughs> then it's successful. So, so. You are going too fast, but okay. I admire you. <laughs> so... Thank you very much, everyone. This has been a great episode. We will be watching what's happening in Montreal um, with great interest and enormous respect and admiration for all of the brilliant people who will be there negotiating yep. over the next two weeks. Uh, we live with a piece of music this week from Boyish. The song is Mum, I Think I'm Gay. Um, so hope you enjoy this. And there will be a bonus that will be out on Tuesday where Christiana has had a wonderful conversation with a group called Hero. You'll learn more about that on Tuesday, so please tune in for that. Other than that, I think this is our last episode of the year. Not quite, no. We got one more. All right, other than, more. That, other than that, we'll see you next week. All right, so see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. Hi, this is Boyish. We're an indie duo based in Los Angeles. The song we're playing today is called Mom, I Think I'm Gay. It's a song that was off our first album, Garden Spider, that came out in 2020, right before the pandemic. It's a song about struggling to come out of the closet and being afraid that the people that you love won't accept you. When it comes to the current climate crisis, we're optimistic by the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which will lend itself to significantly cutting the emission of greenhouse gases. We're outraged by the lack of urgency that it will take to actually bring climate solutions to the world at scale. Kind of felt like this since I was 15 Please kill me, you're so pretty and I'm so blue But I hate you too Can I bless you? Would you hate me too? And I'm sorry But you look just like heaven If I ever get to go So be my brother go another episode of outrage and optimism boyish boyish is new to me what a christmas treat uh boyish is the collaboration between singer songwriter india shore and guitarist claire altendahl uh the track that you just heard was mom i think i'm gay and i was actually just thinking about this as advice to our listeners, if you're about to go spend some time over the holidays with some younger millennials or Gen Zers, Boyish is a great band to bring up saying, hey, I heard this artist, check them out. They're picking up steam as a duo, and now is actually the time to start adding them to your Apple Music or Spotify follows because their time is coming. I have four 
I went on their YouTube channel and I found four videos that I'm going to recommend <laughs> that you watch. Um, so here they are. First one, smithereens. Number two, legs. Number three, congratulations. And number four, superstar. Now, you don't have to memorize that. And those aren't in any particular order, but actually I think smithereens is my personal favorite. There are links you can click in the show notes. So just go there. You can go watch all of them. And for my favorite listeners who make it all the way to the credits at the end, a fun fact, uh, last week's artist, Belle, did a track with Boyish that's off her latest record titled Jet Lag, which I recommended that album last week. Link in the show notes to that as well. You can go listen. Would you look at that? Artists we've had on the podcast working together. Can't take credit for the collaboration, but I think I'm going to. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, please go check out the show notes for all of Boyish's socials, links to their music, of course. They are planning more releases in spring 2023. More music, more stuff to enjoy. Boyish. So good. Thank you to our guest this week, Sanjan. You can keep up to date with Sanjan and the work of Conservation International by clicking around in the show notes. It's all there. Thank you, Sanjan. Moving right along, we mentioned it at the top of the episode, but the listener survey is closing soon. So please make it a priority to fill out those uh, open text boxes, I think they call them, just in places where you can type whatever you want instead of just clicking like strongly agree, strongly disagree. Now, I should mention, we're reading all your responses and those responses will shape the podcast next year. So I promise it's really short. There's no, you know, grade at the end of it. You don't pass or fail. You just complete. <laughs> uh, it's open response. It's, it's an open book. You can have your notes with you. <laughs> uh, it sounds like I'm prescribing an at-home test or something, but I'm not. Um, we seriously can't wait to hear from you. And time is of the essence. Please check the link below and fill out that survey. It will help us out so much. And it'll make the podcast better for you. You'll, you'll enjoy it more. Okay, that is everything. Thank you so much for sticking with us for the entire episode. This Friday, The Way Out is In is posting an episode on generosity. And next week, Tuesday, we'll have another episode of Outrage and Optimism on Hero Circles. We, we just finished recording that I think a couple days ago. It was fantastic. Uh, can't wait for you to hear that. And generosity is also part of that episode. You won't want to miss it. And next Thursday, our last episode of the year, we have a special guest. You won't want to miss it. I keep saying you won't want to miss it. There's so much going on. You're not going to want to miss. Just hit subscribe. We'll see you next week. Bye.